Hello everyone, welcome to the Reader's Room. I'm your host Renee, and today we're joined by three avid readers, Colleen, AJ, and Joy. We'll be reviewing Hitmakers by Derek Thompson. So we'll start with Colleen. What did you think about the book? Well, Renee, I have to tell you, when Aaron gave me a copy of the book, I thought, oh, uh, I'm going to have to reward myself with a chocolate cupcake if I can finish whatever chapters I have to read, because I thought, oh, this is going to be dry and boring. But then I started reading the book, and I, I was hooked. I, I found it fascinating. I, I thought it was an easy read. Um, I really appreciated the, the, the variety of topics which he covered, from art to music to literature to song. And I thought he did marvelous research, A, in telling us how these hits became hits, but also he talked about the psychology of the people who purchase these hits and the kinds of things that they're looking for. Yeah. And it, I mean, if I were someone trying to, to produce a hit, I, I think this would be a marvelous how-to book. I agree with that. AJ, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts? I think I'd actually disagree. Like, um, I, I, well, no, I also uh, enjoyed the book. I thought it flowed very nicely. It was a fun read. But for me, the entire central premise of it is that there is no way to, there is no formula for producing a hit. Um, there is no magic formula. There's none of that. There is like this incredible element of chaos to it. Mm -hmm. And while you can kind of retroactively look back and say, this is why this became this popular, this is why that became popular, it's impossible to do the same looking forward. It was still a really interesting read, but um, I would not take it as a how-to book to how to like uh, pr produce the next hit. So really, there's no rhyme or reason. Well, there behind. there is, but it's like you can never see it when you're in it. You know, you can only see it when you look backwards. You know, it's hindsight is twenty twenty, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's there's general rules. I don't think it's there's general rules. I think there's very it's it's very difficult to put into practice though. Yeah. He he kind of touches on it a little bit how you can kind of predict. Um, through certain algorithms, I guess, from the past. Um, what do you think, Joy? Um, to me, I think the book is nice. I kind of like the way, like Colin said, you have this, the way he picks up from different um, genres of music, different um, parts of life and how they do, how they actually have their hits. But I kind of also agree with AJ because there's no particular um, way for everybody to know that this is the particular way that you're gonna make a hit. So. Um, to me, it's an interesting read, but I kind of don't like the way the book was written. So that's it. Was it kind of like it's too complex? Okay. Yeah. So it was heavy. Yeah, it's too heavy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes. No, but in order to defend myself just a little, I thought the fact that, you know, he said people would like something familiar with the twist or maybe something new with something familiar. Yeah. Uh, when you got into the the three qualities that a hero should have with whom I audience was identified. So, and, and again, I agree with you, there's still that, that magical, I don't know, fairy dust, kismet, or just some sort of uncontrollable entity out there that does separate yeah. hits from marvelous things that aren't hits. Yeah. That sounds like kind of, I, I took a few notes because I thought the book was pretty interesting too. And what it seems like you're describing is the master of familiar surprise, which is, it's different because the storyline's different, but it's still the same, like you said, a hero, um, an antagonist, a love story somewhere in there, which is what makes a hit, something that's pretty familiar. Right, and that would also explain yeah. the, the success of all the sequels. You look at the Twilight series or, or Star Wars, yeah. um, you know, I think people just like re-emerging themselves in the lives of those characters. Something you can kind of identify with a little mm -hmm. bit. Or if not identify, maybe kind of fantasy, fantasy. That, that fantasy aspect. Subtractive. Yeah. AJ, were you going to say something? Um, I, I guess uh, just playing off that, maybe one thing I'd criticize the book for. Well, first off, I'd say that if you are like a working artist or a working whatever, I think uh, most of that stuff he talks about, finding that perfect debt balance between the familiar and the unfamiliar, you can talk about that all day long, but you need to be able to feel it, which is, I think, what kind of makes someone who makes an artist is someone who's actually able to feel what's the perfect blend of what's familiar and what's unfamiliar that's going to really speak to people right now. Um, one thing I might criticize the book for was that I don't think he played up that there is a kind of a political element to all this. Like uh, people, I think people gravitate to certain pieces of work because of where they are in their life and where the 
country is or where the yeah. world is at a certain point. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's just this is familiar and this is unfamiliar. And as long as you get a perfect balance of familiar and unfamiliar, then you've got like uh, you've got your hit. I mean, it has to be the right kind of familiar. I mean, you need to find like kind of that interesting subversion like inside the old. That isn't just oh, here's something different inside the old, but something that really speaks to how people are feeling at a certain time, right? Yeah, and I think he touched on that in the book when he was talking about the social proof, where he said that sometimes what your neighbor likes or thinks yeah. now becomes what you like or think. Or case in point, if we've got five thousand people at a concert there, maybe in our small town, and I'm not going, but whoa, five thousand people are there. Maybe it's worthy of of you know going and taking a look, or even like with movies. If, if I've, I've got three or four major Hollywood draws, either, you know, in, in a film, I'm probably going to go see, I'm thinking, four major Hollywood draws like this script. I'm thinking it may have something, you know, worthwhile to see. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Well, um, one, yeah, playing on that, one strength of the book, I would say, is that it does not want you to say that there is this kind of this immortal standards of what makes something good and what makes something doesn't. I mean, the, the entire book is about how when a piece of whatever goes into the world, it's entering a dynamic system that's constantly changing and constantly evolving. How something is going to be received today and how something's going to be received 10 weeks ago, are they're two different worlds. Is that kind of like the viral kind of thing? Well, like that, that uh, Isn't that what like makes it viral? Because um, if, uh, like I said, if something is not um, put out on the right time, um, especially in economy, people will not actually, even if it's interesting, even if it's familiar, yeah. people will not just go with it. Yeah. It has to be at the right time. So yeah. whether viral or not viral, or it being a hit in yeah. particular, it has to come out on the right time. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Which also, oh, yeah. No, that was that one song, and I forget the name of the song. I was, was going to say that. Rock Around the Clock that, tonight. Yeah. yeah. Right, where yeah. it came out and didn't do well, and then that little fifth grade boy whose father happened to be somewhat important, you know, heard it, and it took off. This is, a, yeah, this is yeah, what I mean by, yeah. yeah. This is what I mean by dynamic system and why he talks about how there is that real element of chaos mm -hmm. to it where there is just, it, it comes down at the end of it, it's just going to be a dice flip, a, a throw of the dice. The name of that movie was um, Blackboard Jungle. I think we're talking Ooh. about yeah. it. Yeah. But uh, we're talking about the song. The, Rock Around the Clock, yeah. but it, the movie. it gained right, popularity right. because it was behind that movie. Mm -hmm. So it came out in 1950. Didn't do well, it was on the B side, you know, of a, mm -hmm. a cassette just kind of was overlooked. Then they use that same song as kind of like the backtrack for that movie. And it's now probably one of the highest charting songs right, ever. Right. So just kind of to, to touch on what you were saying, mm -hmm. the placement is so important, like where you are, yeah, where, yeah. where you were saying, Joy. Um, you know, where it is at the time. Yeah, at the time. Uh, Joy, I'm gonna start with you. Because <laughs> I'm really interested to hear what you have to say about this next question. <laughs> So how do you feel about okay. the writer's uh, writing style, the author's writing style? Okay. Did you like it? Was it an easy uh, read? How do you feel about it? Like I said, I'm just going to be honest. Um, I'm going to be critic. I'm going to be a critic. I mean, I mean I'm going to be critic for this. The book is interesting. It's nice. I love the book because it's, it has so much information. It exposes you to a lot of information. Yeah. Uh, but the writing is very complex. You have to bring out something that everybody can read anytime. Mm -hmm. Like I was struggling literally to read the book mm -hmm. because it was it was so complex and the dynamics and the, um, the pattern and the style mm -hmm. he used was just uh, like way off. It wasn't like straight, and he he picked up things from different, which was nice. Yeah. Like if you're looking at what he's trying to say, yeah. it's very necessary for him to do that, but. It, at the same time, it just kind of kicked me up. Like I'm here one minute and then I'm there, and because when I read, I like to transit to what I'm reading, okay. so I I can actually feel what the writer is feeling at that particular time. Yeah. But in his book, it was very complex. It okay. was very complicated. I I couldn't get him most times. I like have to like go back, read again okay. and again okay. before I could get it. So, but in everything, the book is right. Just the writing is just the issue. I have. What do you think? Um. I thought it flowed very nicely. Okay. Like I especially as far as like the structure of the book itself goes, I really liked his interlude sections. I thought that was just a nice innovation for a book. You have like these kind of this just mini almost autobiographical chapters yeah. between like the bigger chapters. I hear what you're saying because um, it, it was it was I don't even think it was so much complex. It was yeah. just very sprawling. Like yeah. it was a very kind of a it was a very vague idea he was working with of you know what is hit you know like popularity in the most abstract sense. And he took just examples from everywhere. 
And while it was really, like, I thought, while it was kind of easy to read through, um, it didn't really seem like it had as much focus as it, uh, as it could. Yeah. So what, what I, my experience of it was I had, a, a, it was easy for me to read, but I forgot a lot of it just yeah. because it didn't like have that kind of focus, just because it was so sprawling. It was so sprawling to me too, but I did find myself as I'm reading and kind of go, you know, reading and getting the information every now and again, I would find myself saying, oh, or, you know, having that like aha moment where, yeah. oh, you know, like that's interesting. That's, you know, so if you can kind of keep going through the book, you do come across like little jewels or little bits of information that kind of make a light bulb kind of go off on your head a little bit. <laughs> what do you think, Holly? Well, um, I agree with, with AJ. I, I found it very easy to read. I didn't have a problem with any of the language. Um, I didn't mind that he was going from one place to another because in my previous book clubs, I've read some books where you know, you're, you're in 1892, and then you're up in 2014, and then you're back. You know, you so for me, this this was like this is okay. I, I I'm following this yeah. rather nicely, and I, I did like the fact that again it was sprawling. He 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 did try to cover a lot, but I think he was trying to have some sort of a basis for what makes a hit. And I think if he would have limited it to only a few things, you might yeah. say, well, well, heck, that's that's only two or three topics. What about this, that? Yeah. So, so I was okay because I'm used to reading books where you're jumping all over the place, and my <laughs> brain is so okay of, with that. So you're saying it kind of validated his point with all the many different examples. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I think if you want to make a, a statement about how to succeed in age distraction, if you're just doing two or three forms of art, I think you've limited yourself, and I, I don't think you can. It's validated as well as if you've gone across the spectrum, so to speak. That's a really good way of thinking about it. When you're talking about an age of dis destruction, mm -hmm. that's a, a long time, an age, you know. So that's pretty cool. So what, Colleen, you know, just to kind of keep the conversation going, and I thought you kind of brought up some interesting points about the different examples. Was there a chapter that stood out to you the most? I have to go with chapter one, because of the, the Impressionist, you know, I, I'm a French major, you know, a former French teacher. I love what the Impressionists do with their paintings. So when I'm reading about the Impressionists yeah. and, and how they were able to get into the, the public spotlight between their, their buyer and Mr. Gustave Caillebotte, I was like, I didn't know that. Yeah. So that to me, I just found fascinating. The Fifty Shades of Grey was, was also interesting because mm -hmm. I, I, I'm like, okay, pornography has entered the, the, the mainstream media. And then I, I read, <laughs> oh, Westchester County. All right. Well, maybe it's legit. So, <laughs> so not, first chapter, definitely. Okay. Me too. First chapter, but like, you know. In the chapter, can get different perspectives. Yeah. Um, the first chapter, definitely the power of exposure. Um, the, the power of exposure really caught me, which is the title of the chapter. And that was because of just this one particular line that I really love and it's a question. Mm -hmm. Why is this so famous? Yeah. Like, you know, when you you get that question and the, the writer is trying to, you know, give you an understanding of what he's trying to say and he's trying to put you in the position of what he's trying to, what he's trying to say at the same time. Yeah. So he gave like three instances where people asked why is this so famous and the last one really got me because the last one was a painting, it was a, a French painting, a painting by a French yeah. artist that was done by a, a totally different person yeah. and everybody was just all around this painting and he was like, uh, why is this painting so famous? And then he later discovered that it was a piece that was bought by Gustave. Okay. And because Gustave is so popular and is good and everybody knows him, he's so famous and everything. There's where the familiarity comes in. And then it's so the painting, even if he wasn't the one that literally drew it, yeah. it is famous at the same time. Yeah. So that that's why I just I love that first chapter a lot, the way it, you know, gives you this feel of you being in the book. Like yeah. I said, I always like being <laughs> Yeah, and that's the same with the Mona Lisa. You know, you you go and you go Oh, is that all there is? But they said the Mona Lisa didn't become so famous until it was stolen. Until it was stolen. Again, that oh, exposure. Wow. <laughs> well, I thought. For like 10 years. Well, I think it was even more interesting than the fact. Well, the the the, the it getting stolen was part of it, but then uh, the uh, very experimental avant-garde artist uh, Ducamp um, made a parody of it where he drew the Mona Lisa with a mustache 
and gave it kind of a vulgar epithet. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's awesome because th this is really the thing that kind of just like um, um, pushed it up to just world class fame, most mm -hmm. famous painting of all time. And what's so interesting is that this, you know, this sublime painting, like sublime, it is, you know, the, the, the master work, the, the, the inscrutable smile, all of that, is kind of a retroactive effect of this other artist's complete vulgarity. So mm -hmm. it, it's only because the guy just made the, the horrible postcard of it with like the mustache drawn on that we're able to look at the, the um, La Chaconde, you know, the, the uh, Mona Lisa and see, oh, the sublime painting, the, uh, the, the ageless masterpiece that no one can touch, only because the guy made fun of it. I thought that was a very funny uh, turn. I think that kind of uh, is a good example of where, and what you described was a good example of where quality is not always something that is required to make something a hit. It's, yeah. it's familiar. Yeah. Your familiarity yeah. um, can do that. Do you have a favorite chapter? I like chapter seven, um, uh, rock and roll and randomness. I think it's like for me, this book, um, what's really interesting about it is I see it as kind of engaging in an existential struggle with its own cover. Yeah. Because like what happened is um, I think his publishers told him, okay, we want you to make like a good piece of commercial nonfiction and we know the way it's going to sell is if we can kind of present it as like a gospel of success. Yeah. Even uses that term somewhere. Um, and I think what Th Thompson discovered as he was writing is, like I said, you can't ever really predict a hit. And the thing I liked about, Ch I think that comes out most clearly in chapter seven, where he just talks about how everything else aside, quality aside, politics aside, there is this just kind of this dynamic system with all these weird nodes and all this other stuff. And you just need to like hit like the right thing at the right time. And yeah. you find that fifth grade kid that like listened to your record one time and tells his dad who's a movie producer that yeah. it's like this. Like there is this real element of chaos to it. And um, it's important not to look at things that become hits and say, oh, well, it's clearly because of this, 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 and that. Yeah. Like, and not to forget that element of chaos. Yeah. Which, uh, you know, in the preface, he talks about Trump and Trump's election. And I think this is a great way to look at tr like Trump as a phenomenon. Yeah. Because the guy like hit everything in the book. He was like kind of that mix of the familiar and also the unfamiliar. Yeah. Um, he happened to just hit all the right little nodes and like kind of the distribution system at the right time to kind of become a you know, a hit, a hit himself. Did you guys learn anything new in this book? Something that, like I mentioned before, you have that aha moment where, ooh, that's cool, or I didn't know that, or now that makes sense. Is there anything that kind of stands out a little bit in your mind? Joy, go ahead. Okay. Um, like I said, the book has so much information. I never knew before, prior to reading this book, that you... Um, that there, there are different ways for something to have a hit. Like he said, yeah. it's just not just familiarity, even the ones that are not familiar and other chaos and every other thing. Yeah. I never knew, I thought that there was this straight step-by-step -step process yeah. before your, your thing is gonna have a hit. I never knew that uh, it, it, it just comes randomly and it happens, yeah. you know. That really, really, you know, really caught me and I'm like, oh. Really? <laughs> yeah, like I literally did that when I read that part. I was like, oh, really? Yeah? Okay. So, yeah, so that's, that, that really caught me. Okay. Yeah. What about you, Colleen? Well, I learned a lot of things from this book. And we'll, we'll just talk about the hits, you okay. know, just the whole impressionist thing, the George Lucas and, you know, Flash Gordon, the, the rock around the clock. I the, love that George Lucas uh, reference. Uh, the Fifty Shades of Grey. So, so those are the actual hit things. But then, you know, I appreciate the research that he went to when, um, when on page 89, we were talking about all the rhetorical devices, and I can't remember most of those words, mm -hmm. but it's on page 89. But I mean, and even citing the speeches where, where these devices were used, I thought was really good. Um, Joseph Campbell, I think it was Joseph Campbell, and the, the three qualities necessary to have a good hero in, in literature. Yeah. Um, and just the whole thing with the social proof uh, that, you know, sometimes, you know, the world will, will formulate your way of thinking just because most of the people are involved. I mean, we can look at the election maybe as one way of looking at this social kind of proof. So basically from the hits themselves to some of the, you know, you want to call them psychological insights. Yeah. Uh, so I was, you know, I was pleased with what I, I came away with. And even on a smaller scale outside of like the election, you can look at certain artists that you, you're looking at them and you're like, why are you so successful? This music is not this great. Um, you're kind of crazy. Like, what is it? But it's a lot of things. It's the promotion behind this artist and the following this artist has. Now, um, it isn't necessarily the quality of your, your art, whether it's music or writing. It's the followers you have with all these social media outlets, mm -hmm. too, that kind of give way to these hit makers, if that makes sense to you. What do you think? 
Um, yeah, there was the, the book is, as we've said, it's chock full of anecdotes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I really like the thing about when well, we've already talked about Calibat. Uh, I, I really like the thing that he, when he talked about Raymond Lowey, who apparently is like almost responsible for designing America. Yeah. Like just like, uh, you know, so much like he just sees influence everywhere without even really knowing his name. But, um, you know, like I said, I um, it didn't feel like there was enough of a unifying force behind okay. it all. It just, it just felt like so many anecdotes. Yeah. Well, uh, there was one thing that I kind of learned that I actually kind of highlighted too, and I'm kind of going to segue into our next question, but I thought it was pretty cool, the study of the mice that they had, where they played the B note for the mice, and it surprised them. But after a while, after he played the B note so many times, he stopped playing that note and entered in like the C note. Mm -hmm. And then now that surprised him. Mm -hmm. um, and he kind of likened it to the way a song is created with the verse, the hook, and the bridge. Um, so was there anything that you guys in the book that stood out, maybe not necessarily your favorite chapter, but just an excerpt that you highlighted that you kind of think is important? Well, I have to go back to chapter one, Miss Renee. Okay. Because <laughs> That's I, I, okay. I, and much as AJ said, you know, I, I, loved, I loved hearing about the history of Gustav Kaiba. Yeah. And it was kind of funny because I just finished reading it, and I'm at the art museum again, and I'm looking for Georges Seurat's mm -hmm. Dimanche l'après-midi sur la Grand Jatte, the Sunday afternoon at the Grand Jatte. And it wasn't hanging in its usual place. And I'm like, but what do I see? There's this Parisian city scene done by Gustave Caillebotte. And so, you know, I'm like in awe. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm loving this. Because I was really able to like, you know, put a picture to the artwork oh. and then found out that there were a few more of his paintings in the art museum as well. So that's why I had to pick that one up because I had like a personal, yeah. you know, reaction or involvement with that particular chapter with Monsieur Caillebotte. Mm. What, anything you highlighted, AJ? Uh, any, any highlights for you, I guess, rather is a better way of asking that question. Well, one thing I wrote down was on page 130, he talks about how there used to be this effect where people who would watch uh, Fox News all the time, you know, like uh, my grandma watches Fox News always yeah. playing in the background, how it used to be on the old TVs. Uh, if you ever watch Fox News, you see that the logo spins. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the reason why, yeah, they, he talks about how the reason why is that when they used to have just a static logo, people would keep the, that show on for so long that it would burn itself into the TV. Oh. Like, you just, like, you'd see this ghost of the Fox News yeah. logo when, when, no matter what uh, channel you were on. Mm -hmm. So I, I bring up that point just because I really like, uh, like I said, I really like was trying to read a lot of political stuff through this. Yeah. Uh, specifically, um, I think his point about repetition and how things can kind of become popular, then become kind of played out, but still be kind of lurking in this kind of so, like cultural subconscious. Yeah. Um, I think as far as politics go, and when you see like kind of a reemergence of like really kind of far right stuff, people want to say, wow, that was such a surprise. I can't believe that we have all this stuff happening in Virginia last year, right? Yeah. Um, I wanted to say, I think this gives you a good idea of how something like that, like kind of that really crazy right, uh, right wing political stuff can be lying just below the surface as this kind of vaguely familiar thing, just waiting for, uh, waiting to hit on that kind of cascade that he talks about in chapter seven, yeah. where the thing will just, this thing that's kind of been there, vaguely familiar for everyone, can suddenly take off and just become the dominant force in the culture at a certain time. So I really like that stuff. I think it like um, I think is this is a good book to kind of understand um, how things reemerge like that. And um, how he also talks about how you hear it enough, whether it's true or false, you just think it's true because you've heard it so right. many exactly. times. Mm -hmm. Now it becomes fact, and that fake news, those right. alternate facts, well, kind of. Yeah. It, it was a really good point also about the uh, when he was talking about Fox News, how he said it's a good example of how when they're like uh, when you'd bring people on to talk, like discuss evolution. And you'd have like the crazy, just, just the really crazy cranks that would say, no, you know, it was like aliens that yeah. seeded life on Earth, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> you know, you, so, you, so you bring them on so you can have like the other guy say, debunk him and say, no, this is stupid, no, this is stupid, no, this is stupid. Yeah. But the sheer fact that people are getting exposed to that point of view yeah. ends up creating a cult following for it, you know, and that, that cult following grows and seeds and eventually bl blooms and flourishes, yeah. you know. It's a whole well, other fact. Yeah, right? and especially if, if you believe that. Now, now you've got some, some basis for your belief system. If someone on Fox News, okay, must be important. So my belief system maybe is okay. He talked about like how comedians gauge um, yeah. their comedy, where they'll try a, a joke, right? And if everyone laughs, no matter how controversial it is, then that's okay, and that's like the new yeah. kind of standard. But if he says something kind of eh, and no one says anything, he knows, okay, that's, that's the bar. You know, don't, not to take it too far further than that. What do you think? Um, I think the part that I had it was on page 23. Mm -hmm. 
where <clears throat> after a hundred years, after Gustav's death, um, they cut and saw a painting and was like asked the same question, why is this so famous? Yeah. You know, the power of familiarity. Um, I think that's what really, like, I was so awed by that. So I just, <laughs> that really caught me, like, the power of familiarity can really make anything gain, you know, gain popularity at the same time, make a hit. Yeah. So, so that was why, that was what I highlighted. Okay. We've kind of talked about a lot of different ideas and thoughts and opinions. Is this a book that you would recommend to someone to read? Uh, me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. I mean, when I, in my defense, when I spoke about the writing, I, I didn't really like say, oh, this is bad writing. It's brilliant. Yeah. You know? It's good. It's just that for me personally, it, it really gave me a hard time to read. Okay. But I would definitely recommend this for anybody I meet that loves, any bibliophile that loves reading because I know that it has so many information and it's, it's mind blowing. It's, it has so many exposure. There's many things you will see here that you had never thought in all your lifetime that actually even exists. And it comes into our reality, like our present times, yeah. like using, goes into different politics, music, you know, different genres of life, yeah. you know. So I, I would definitely recommend this to anybody. I think I would recommend it also, um, but I guess the person I would recommend it to is someone who's into pop culture, but kind of wants to think critically about it. You know, you have these ideas like, this is popular or whatever, but if you want to know why, you know, this is kind of like a good book yeah. to kind of go off of. I'd actually agree with that. Um, I, uh, I wouldn't, I, I, who I wouldn't recommend it to is the person like, you know, like a 20 year old who's like, I want to become like the next, uh, you know, Kanye West yeah, or something, right? Because yeah. I don't think this book, like I said, I don't think this book will give you that. But if someone is kind of like, you know, just mm -hmm. interested to see yeah, why, yeah. you know, why does, why do these things emerge and why do these things become popular? Um, from a critical perspective, that's like, yeah, it's a, it's a good book to look into. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have to agree with everybody else there. Because of, it's easy to read, I think because of, of the research, I think the variety of the topics. I, I think it's just, just some neat things that you, you now know that you didn't know before. And I will recommend it to my book club as a possible read for a month. Coming I will up. recommend it to my book club too. <laughs> Colleen, thank you so much for that insight. I really appreciate it. Kind of gave me a different perspective on the book. Thank you, AJ, Joy, and thank you guys for tuning in to the Reader's Room. Also, please remember to follow In Good Company Digital on Instagram. Thank you. And please check out the book, Hitmakers, How to Succeed in an Age of Distraction.